Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Case Spring webinar session, uh, leveraging AI and innovation tools in the community setting. I'm really excited to introduce our uh, guest today, Dr. Mark Sushi. Hey, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks, Randy. Welcome, Mark. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Randy Miles. I'm the Chief of Breast Imaging at Denver Health and also an Assistant Editor of the Journal of American of College of Radiology. Uh, before we get uh, started, just a few announcements. Uh, for our med students, just want to bring to your attention um, a platform offered by the uh, ACR, Medical Student Hub. Um, it's a place where you can join to access resources, volunteer opportunities, scholarships, and community. Um, remember that ACR membership is free, um, and if you do uh, join Medical Student Hub, um, we provide there's a free ebook um, that provides some of these resources that I mentioned earlier um, that can be very helpful. Um, we want you to join the conversation, um, uh, so uh, we want to introduce you to engage.acr.org uh, for. Uh, physicians and radiologists working at SafetyNet in the SafetyNet setting and also in community hospitals. It's a great way, way to share your experiences, goals, challenges with the online forum. So welcome everyone today. I'm excited to introduce our guest, Dr. Mark Succi. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm pretty sure many of you um, are familiar with uh, Mark's work, but he's the strategic innovation leader, leader at Mass General Brigham um, Innovation. He's also the Associate Chair of Innovation and Commercialization at MGB Radiology, um, Executive Director of the MESH Incubator, um, and also an Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, he's an inventor with licenses to public biotechnology companies and runs an operations research lab. Um, he's won numerous awards and has been recognized as Forbes Magazine, um, one of the top 30 under 30 in science um, and healthcare lists. So, Welcome, Mark. Very uh, impressive background. Um, first, just wanted to see if you can talk a little bit more, uh, a little more about your current role um, in innovation and technology. Yeah, thanks, Randy, and thanks to the ACR for for having me and highlighting um, this stuff. So, I guess what I do, uh, you know, I practice emergency radiology um, about a day and a half a week now. And uh, the bulk of my time is spent at our tech transfer office at corporate. So Mass General Brigham, we have tech transfer office, just like you're, if you're in an academic institution, probably have one as well. Um, and there, what we do is develop talent and educational development programs to create new innovators across all 60,000 employees at, at Mass General Brigham. So I lead that group. Um, I also I also lead, or I'm also part of the Strategic Innovation Leader Group at Tech Transfer, which really is looking at the healthcare market and where um, the primary drivers of value are going to be in the next five to ten to fifteen years, and then taking that knowledge, those analyses, and implementing programs, whether it becomes a, a new thematic center, um, like the Gene and Cell Therapy Center we have at our institution. Um, or maybe development programs or grants um, to help create new research and commercialize that research into licensable intellectual property, technology, new companies that could be venture funded. So it's about um, looking at what's going to impact healthcare and figuring out ways to make the organization become a leader in that, in that area. Um, so that's about three days, 60% of my job. And then the last day, uh, I run the Mesh Incubator, which is across the system, of course, uh, started in radiology and is headquartered there. Um, and shout out to to my chair, Jim Brink, for supporting and, and starting that with me, um, where we help folks interested in creating new devices, software, digital tools, AI tools, actually get them off the ground past the initial idea and start that development process. And so that, you know, is, is a complex process of funding, of resources, of prototyping. And so we have a physical workshop space that everyone gets access to and, and we provide that. Um, and then lastly, I'm the Associate Chair of Innovation and Commercialization at the Enterprise uh, for Radiology. And what that means is really honing in on how radiology is doing uh, in terms of creating new products, new patents, new intellectual property, um, tracking those KPIs year over year, the revenue coming back, 
um, and most recently creating kind of a team of innovation experts across Mass General, Brigham, and other institutions um, that really have a focus of whether it be startups, um, extended reality, uh, SBIR, patents, something else, devices, um, where they can be kind of the liaison for faculty interested in these areas. So we have a point of contact for each real domain of innovation. And I think um, when you're starting out, when you're trying to be an innovator, you really need that mentorship and support. And so that's kind of the, the newest system we created. So this kind of a, a tour of, of what I do, Randy. Seems like you would require like a large multidisciplinary team uh, to work through some of these issues. Can you talk about some of the team members and their, their backgrounds? Yeah, I think one of the benefits of being, you know, closely associated with our med school and just having so many uh, talented folks um, at our institution, and I'm sure at your institutions as well, is that um, everyone's got a kind of a, a niche that they're they're really good in. So um, we have folks that have created, you know, venture funded startups before that have gone public, like Matt Rosen is one of those, and he works on the team as well. Um, a lot of uh, senior um, I would say associate to full professors that might be slightly earlier in their innovation journey, right? Because when you become a, a full professor, largely it's on the back of either research or, or education sometimes, but not necessarily on innovation. So a lot of those folks are now creating new um, career development opportunities in an innovation domain alongside their kind of track record of research. Um, and quite frankly, a ton of students that are kind of the new generation of just really interested. Maybe they saw folks do what they want to do before, start companies, tons of med students and then residents that help out um, on a volunteer basis, on a research basis, um, and are really vital to running uh, incubator programs, innovation translation programs. And so um, really the, the trainees form a lot of the backbone of this stuff. And for them, it's it's obviously really valuable for us, but uh, for them, they hopefully get a, uh, a step up and some focus in their career development um, and some help to take that next step by by hopefully learning something, uh, you know, from us. So. That's awesome. Um, and and um, Mark, you've taken kind of a unique, very interesting pathway. Um, you know, I would almost say like a little non-traditional in the typical radiology trajectory. Can you talk a little bit more about this path and for med students and residents who may be interested in following a similar path, like what prepared you for this role and what can they do? Yeah, I think um, this path for me, looking back on it, probably started well before med school. Um, you know, I, I break down if you want to be an innovator, um, which definition could change depending on who you ask. Um, I would say there's two real components and there's one. Uh, the first one is being really good at solving problems and learning how to solve problems. Um, you know, if, if someone speaks five languages, they can probably learn the six languages language a lot faster than um, me, who only speaks English, can learn and learn a second language. So, you know, you speak these languages, and eventually you understand and speak the language of language, and understand that innovation is really a simple set of patterns and, and ways to break down problems. Um, and it almost doesn't matter if it's in digital, if it's in AI, if it's in device, but if you become really good at solving problems, um, working with others, breaking down problems, being resourceful, um, following things like the design thinking uh, philosophy, um, that really, in my opinion, is the most important skill you can develop. As a high school student, I, I went to a robotics lab, um, a robotics competition called First Robotics. Um, run by Dean Kamen, and I, I learned a little bit about how to solve problems in robotics. And then in undergrad, it was a little more in devices, and in med school, it was devices and digital, and now a little bit of AI. So um, if you want to become someone who, you know, is an innovator, I, I would just say be really good at solving problems and hone those skills above all else. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the first part. You know, the second thing I would say is understanding and having an appreciation um, that having a good idea is is great, but is is the very first minimal step to creating an actual innovative solution that's used and impacts patients. And so you see people with this disease that like all you need is a good idea and they're really protective of it. And it's mostly folks who haven't gone through the process at least once before. Um, but really the beauty of innovation is 
taking that idea, validating it, working with focus groups, creating prototypes, going back to the drawing board, iterating, changing everything. And that whole journey beyond just the initial idea is, is kind of the creativity and what actually makes um, a true uh, solution be impactful at the bedside, whether it's on a patient, whether the end user is a surgeon, radiologist, doesn't matter. Um, so I would say if you're interested in following those paths, hone that problem solving skill and that execution skill, um, those are really the two components. And you know, I can count on, and if you can hone both of those, then you're like very small percentage of people that exist in healthcare. I can count on maybe a little more than one hand the, the people I know um, in our system that truly are, are elite at both of those components. Um, some of you may see labs where, where the PI seems to just bounce around from different fields, whether maybe one day they're in AI, one day they're in drug, you know, one day they're in devices. Um, that's someone who truly understands the underlying um, way to break down problems, solve them and execute on it. So um, I would say those two components of solving problems and then being really good at executing and working in teams to, to make those solutions a reality are the, the key components. I think that's great advice. Um, and I'll just highlight the uh, value of mentors and especially at that stage when you're training, um, you know, if you see someone that's doing something cool online or something that you're interested in, um, you know, don't be afraid to send an email. I think especially when you're a trainee, there's so many uh, mentors who are working in this space who are willing to provide some guidance um, or give you some advice on, on how to start. And, and um, Mark, you've mentored so many yet junior and young um, innovators. So um, just a testament to you and, and your work. So let's jump into some questions about AI, which I know a lot of people are joining us um, to hear more about. Um, so one of the big questions I'm curious about, how do you describe AI to patients um, who are afraid or concerned about its use in healthcare? I get this quite a bit. Um, day to day um, with some of my conversations with uh, some of my breast imaging patients. Yeah, I think it's it's you can attack it a few different ways. Um, not being a data scientist, I'm also coming at it from the, the level of um, a little bit of a researcher, but end user as well. Um, so, you know, AI in my own healthcare. I think it helps to kind of look at the data and what patients and the public think about AI and why they think those things. There's a there's a few research study, I think it was done in 2022, um, where it asked, uh, are you comfortable with uh, AI being used in your healthcare uh, provision of healthcare? And actually like 60% of people are uncomfortable with it, right? So only, only about 40% are comfortable. And then when you ask them, will it lead to better patient outcomes? About 38% say, yes, it will. And like 33% say it won't, it actually be worse outcomes and the rest are kind of undecided, don't really know. And so, um, it's not, will the technology be better than a radiologist or a pathologist at diagnosing my disease? It's will it actually lead to a better outcome? So I think the public is educated in general. They understand that AI can very quickly, maybe it has in a lot of ways, surpass um, the ability, the technical ability in certain specific scenarios to detect hemorrhage or something on a head CT. But ultimately the concern is, is it gonna actually improve my healthcare? And so digging into that a little bit, folks are concerned about bias, right? They're concerned about not being treated equally. Um, they're concern concerned about access to, to true specialists and physicians above AI, you know, and they're concerned about um, the patient doctor relationship. So the vast majority of folks thinks that AI will, will worsen that relationship. And then I can imagine if, if I'm a patient um, and an AI is telling me to take a medication for whatever disease, um, I might really be willing to not buy into that. I might buy in a lot better if I have a trust relationship with a physician at my bedside. So I think explaining to patients that there's always going to be a human in the loop that's actually provisioning the healthcare. Um, AI is an augmenting tool, reassuring them, and this has to be true, that is trained on large, annotated, diverse data sets, um, that it's not going to treat you differently, and that ultimately the, the end decision lies with a licensed healthcare provider, you know, someone who, who ultimately can rule over rule. I think the other part of using AI is that a lot of times it's kind of a black box or maybe it's thought of as a black box, whether or not that's true um, is another question. Um, but being able to explain why AI said something and 
understanding why it said something and imparting that explanation to the patient, um, I think would go a long way uh, to helping patients who are concerned about its use in healthcare. Sounds great. Um, so can you, I think you've given a lot of great advice for providers um, in terms of talking to patients about AI, but I'm curious about your thoughts on the current state of AI um, in radiology. Um, are there some potential growth areas that you think that we are potentially not filling? Um, and are we utilizing it as effectively as we can at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, obviously, there's a ton of research on AI. We see it all the time. Um, for the numbers people, uh, you know, at our market sector meetings, I think the projections for AI is the market size is around 800 million now, and it's going to be like 8 billion in healthcare, in, sorry, in medical imaging specifically by 2030. Um, growing really fast, um, the Asia Pacific region is where a lot of the growth is happening now um, in terms of companies. And so that's kind of the current market state of AI. Um, obviously, we all probably know that AI uh, is adept at image analysis, um, has, has great benefits to workflow optimization, um, predictive analytics. And so um, tons of studies there. I think the technical ability is, is obvious in these areas. And then when I'm thinking of potential growth areas, I'm thinking, um, how is it going to get, how is it going to achieve growth at scale and truly be adopted in the community, in the academic settings, um, across the U S rural, uh, urban. Um, and I think a large part of it is integrating these tools specifically within electronic health records and not, not simply, you know, opening AI tabs and, and, but truly deeply integrating AI benefits, um, into our dictation systems for radiologists or into the medical record, um, you know, deeply into patient notes. And so um, I think companies that are working to integrate their tools with Epic and with Cerner or whatever it might be are the ones that are gonna truly grow. Um, and I, I think that's a big challenge is uh, we test AI tools. There's one we, we tested before where basically you can set your phone down, it'll record what you're saying to the patient. So obviously this is not for radiologists, maybe you, the IR guys can, uh, it's for them. But you set your phone down, you talk to the patient and it creates a note in a cloud in a separate browser. It's a really good patient note and it pulls out the ICD-10 codes. But then you gotta go copy it from your browser into Epic, you know, there, there's like an extra friction point and those just can't happen for any large scale adoption. and. That was the big complaint about this particular tool and beta testing. They fixed it. It's integrated. It's it's going to be uh, deployed across the system soon. Um, so I think that's a big thing. Um, you know, another challenge is uh, is making sure the tools we use, obviously secure, privacy forward, um, but are also ethical and and are trained on diverse data sets that are annotated properly, um, diverse demographics. And so I think. Um, that's one thing that to truly be effective, um, we're going to have to uh, make sure happens. Um, you know, lastly, I'll say um, we want people to use AI, which means we need to train ourselves. And, and the ACR is huge on and the next generation of physicians early. So med students, trainees on how to critically appraise AI tools, how to, how to assess them and ask questions before using them how to understand the output and when the output might not be correct and training radiologists and physicians uh, to use these tools and to understand how to use them. And so education, I think, is a huge part of a challenge in, in true wide scale adoption going forward. No, you definitely read my mind uh, in terms of um, wanting to know more about like what we can do to train kind of the next um, group of uh, radiologists or um, they'll be coming uh, through. Um, do you think in radiology, we focus a little bit too much on kind of the image interpretation or is there a little bit too much emphasis on that aspect of AI and not some of the other things that you just mentioned in terms of how AI can assist um, in our daily workflow and in other areas? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, obviously the, you know, I'm not, well, I won't say the name of the person, but they, you know, how many years ago, I think in 2016, Someone said stop training radiologists because in 2021, you know, AI will replace them. Um, 
you know, and it's always easy to make those predictions. So I think diagnosis and reading images is obviously the main, the, the, the thing that everyone thinks of um, when they're kind of on the outside looking into radiology. Um, but ourselves, we know that, you know, yes, that's helpful, but that's more of a long-term vision um, of 5, 10, 15, 20 years of truly getting at true diagnostic support, um, partially because the technology needs to improve, partially because there's regulation, and partially because it's going to be a long time until people are trusting sole radiologist or AI radiology reads um, from the radiology perspective, from the referring provider perspective. So there's an adoption curve that's a huge component of, of that. And you look at the lower risk side on implementing things now that AI can help in. Um, you look at things like creating automatic impressions on your reports that can save a ton of time. Um, we're using a tool now that's trained on lots of your own reports on how you make impressions, how you order things. And uh, you write the body of your report, you know, touch a button, and all of a sudden you got an impression that sounds like how you would have written it. And it's really, really good. So I think things like um, documentation support is huge and is going to be really useful for radiologists, especially because there's a workforce gap. Um, radiologists can't read fast enough. Uh, there's there's too much volume, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I will say research. Um, AI is super helpful in, in making sense and pulling data from medical records, having done this you know, ourselves every day, um, annotating, um, distilling, summarizing records, pulling out impressions for radiology studies and stuff like that. Um, so I think those are two key areas that AI is going to make a big difference in um, beyond just the diagnostic of the imaging. And then the last thing I'll say is that there is a component of non-radiologists potentially using the diagnostic component of AI, you know, good to read, you know, the low hanging fruit, let's say like an NG2 placement in the ED or something, or like an, an ankle x-ray, which are actually, you know, can be difficult to read if, if you don't know. Um, and so I think there's going to be a component of extending the uh, skill set of non-radiologists a little bit into that superficial um, radiology component of relatively low risk studies. And then we'll probably have to confront that at some point um, as well. So. Yeah, great points. I think with increased volumes, short staffing, you know, making radiologists more efficient means we can get through uh, more studies. We can get patients their reports faster. So these are all great things. We did get a question. Will AI replace radiologists? I think you touched on it. Anything else you want to add uh, to that point or we can move on if you feel like you got everything? Well, um, I think it's like the, the classic question. And I think the classic response is, is like AI won't replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists. So that's like, the, you know, if I was writing an article, I, I would say that. Um, I yeah. think, you know, going one step beyond, um, it really means for me is that radiologists who understand and are trained and are brought up in AI and make an effort to uh understand how to use these tools to the best of their ability will simply be faster um be able to read more complex cases in less time than non-radiologists realistically because of that workforce gap it's unlikely that you, what does it mean to replace a radiologist who's getting replaced what do they do they're probably still going to be a radiologist um so i think the answer to the question is for me is, is obviously no not in my career or in my opinion your career um randy and so I don't think it'll replace radiologists. Um, yes, it'll augment radiologists. Yes, you'll be faster. But um, I think considering the technology state that it still has to go a little bit, considering the adoption curves and the resistance adoption, the regulation and the patient concerns, um, not in our lifetime will it replace radiologists. And that's just my personal opinion. I'm, I would be happy to be wrong uh, in a lot of cases, but. No, great, uh, great insight. Um, and we will be sharing uh, a few, three three of uh, Mark's innovation articles from the JCR. Um, so a great way to kind of stay abreast with like what's going on um, kind of in innovation in AI is to, you know, really stay up to date with the literature and JAC, JACR, um, you know, does publish quite a bit um, in this space so that you can kind of stay up to date with what's going on. Uh, one of the things that um, you've published and um, looked at, Mark, is Chat GPT. Chat GPT. 
um, and it's uh, in utilization in radiology. I was hoping we could talk a little bit more about that and, and how you see that being useful um, in our field. Yeah, I think, um, you know, ChatGPT is, is being a tool, you know, a generative AI uh, is, has the potential to be really useful. I think we're just scratching the surface on it. Obviously it falls under AI in general. Um, uh, you know, for us, ChatGPT and Gemini or similar, you know, generative AI tools, whatever the UI that's overlying them might be, um, could be really useful in things like diagnostic assistance. Um, so obviously help in interpreting imaging results, what this means, helping referring providers. Um, uh, decision support, I think, is a huge one. It's what we were really interested in when we published one of those uh, articles. So, for example, um, you know, if you're a primary care physician and you have maybe you're in a practice with a thousand patients and uh, you want to quickly figure out who needs uh, mammography, right? Who needs to be screened? Um, no, you don't have to chart biopsy all those patients, um, but you can uh, feed their records through an API into something like GPT, obviously behind a firewall, you know, in your institution um, and find out based on their age, last exam, risk factors, according to the ACR appropriateness criteria, who needs what exam. And so you can quickly figure out um, and do kind of like a mass pre-screening for folks who need screening in this particular case. So that level of decision support is really powerful um, and I think will be really useful. And I'm looking forward to seeing that in practice. And we're looking at integrating that kind of method in a couple of different ways. Um, a few other things that may be lesser talked about, but education and training of radiologists. Um, I was, we've been working on, and we've talked to a couple other medical societies um, that are doing things like maintenance of certification and in training examinations. And they have these questions. And while the obvious, you know, next step for me is, uh, well, why don't we train a generative AI like ChatGPT on 30 years of question writing and the, uh, you know, the outcomes and the results and make a, you know, professional question writer. Um, and so synthetic education is kind of where I'm going with this and the ability to create new training materials um, using ChatGPT a lot faster with a lot you know, it's very difficult to create these questions. And so without a lot of that manual time, um, similar to radiology, and then there'll be a human in the loop reviewing 10 questions at a time, I think is really powerful. Um, you can also imagine cases where you have a question that 60% of the people get right. And you say, okay, um, chat GPT with your knowledge and with our data set, make it so 72% of patients answer the, or uh, radiologists answer this correctly. And so there's titration component there of difficulty of questions. Um, I think patient communication and engagement is, is a big one too. And I see a lot of this, especially with the ACR, um, patient friendly reports. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of great articles I've seen uh, in JCR about this, um, but the ability to instantly, especially with um, patients having instant access to the reports, creating reports for patients that they can actually understand, right? That's in, in patient language and not in a structured report that's optimized sometimes for billing instead of for actually communicating with patients. So I think that's a big component of it. Um, you know, another one I think is, is also playing a triage game um, that's patient facing. So you can imagine a couple using chatbots for, for patient care. Um, patients have colonoscopy the next day or maybe they have an, an interventional radiology procedure. Um, they have questions about how to prepare. It's 9 p.m. at night. You know, when can they start eating? You can really simply train uh, chatbots, um, whether it's using a GPT or something else, to answer these questions based on your institutional policies and procedures. So um, a couple ways there, I think, you know, food for thought, just beyond the, the general AI, you know, reading images and stuff like that. Perfect. How are we able to get some of this technology to kind of community settings um, or some settings that may be able to, you know, benefit um, just due to maybe more limited resources um, than some of our kind of larger academic uh, centers? Yeah, I think um, so for community settings, I think it, it's ultimately going to boil down to creating tools that are at a price point that community settings can afford um, that maybe come bundled up to the question I was on the screen with 
proper security features, um, diverse data sets, uh, validated data sets. So that community setting that doesn't have the resources to kind of do their own extreme due diligence on these tools, um, uh, they might not be a first adopter, but maybe they would be a second adopter um, after an institution like Denver Health or like Mass General Brigham has, has done that due diligence. So I think having kind of off the shelf tools, um, maybe the, they don't integrate with the EHR as well, but they can still be used. Um, you know, I'm just thinking that community settings might not have such a robust IT department that they can dedicate, you know, six months to, to integrating some of these tools. So I think ease of use, ease of integration, um, any vendor that creates kind of like the Apple version of, of an AI tool, um, as opposed to like the, the Linux or Windows version of it would be adept to, to capture the community market. Um, I'm sure there's much more on that. We'll probably have some comments, but no, that's how no, I answer no. that question. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that they're definitely, uh, you know, like as a need for just like increased partnerships um, and, and definitely some responsibility for a lot of, you know, like ac academic centers who are doing this research or even in private industry to be able to, um, you know, figure out ways that we can translate this technology just to make sure that it all, um, you know, patients can benefit. But for organizations, um, they're looking to assess the quality of these tools that are on the, you know, the market. Are there questions they should be asking just to, you know, make sure that this technology works for their particular department, organization, um, or hospital setting. Yeah, so definitely thought of this one a little bit. Um, very first, the actual first thing I, I would ask, and I'm interested in when we look at investments for AI tools is things like, is this company a business? Is it gonna be around in two or three years? Um, you know, the worst thing to do is to, to integrate a vendor and then that vendor sells to, to an incumbent. Um, and then all of a sudden you're kind of left out in the lurch from a support and from a buy-in perspective, you spent all this time. Um, and so I see a lot of companies, a lot of vendors at RSNA, you know, my question is who's building a business or who's building just a feature set to get acquired. So that's kind of the, the investor slash business mindset. Um, actually asking the right questions though. So obviously technical performance um, accuracy, reliability, you want to ask about validation. Um, is, is the tool actually validated in real world clinical scenarios? Um, what's the underlying data you're using? Uh, we talked a lot about this, but I, I want to know, is it going to integrate with our existing systems? Um, how much is a lift? Uh, is it going to be a huge lift to actually integrating this stuff? Um, that's, that's going to greatly affect usability and, and adoption. Um, the support, the support level. Um, anyone who's worked in in radiology knows that the IT department uh, is a frequent speed dial number. At least for myself, maybe not for 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 other institutions. Um, so I, I want to know that if we're using an AI tool, there's actual expert IT support on that particular tool available at any time. Um, it's kind of one of those scenarios, like flying a plane, is like you can't really have stuff that doesn't work once you depend on it. And so we really need to have that support buttoned up. Um, something you, you got to ask, of course, is the regulatory approval component of it. Um, I expect that companies will have this buttoned up if they're selling a tool, um, but you still need to ask about that, how they handle data, um, things like, is the data secure? Is it HIPAA compliant? Is it uh, third party audited against things like um, hacks and penetration? And then, from the ethical component, I mean, I think, again, to get patients to want to accept these tools, you want to ask about uh, how it was trained. Was it trained on diverse demographic data sets? Does it treat all demographics, sociodemographics the same? And you want to see that data, ideally, and, and you want to actually look at the data. Companies should be sharing that. Um, and so those are some of the questions, you know, if I was looking to integrate it, I would ask, um, you know, if I want large scale adoption across my institution. That's great. And then in terms of uh, organizations, if they are looking to or to potentially build their own AI models or to work with someone um, like you, who's like an innovator, do you have any advice for um, people that are like are for, you know, leadership or departments that are looking to partner or collaborate with other innovators or, or innovation leaders? Yeah, I would. I would say this probably goes for pretty much anything. Um, 
AI or or not AI in terms of the innovation is you want to really look at first validate that the tool you're building or the model you're building or the algorithm there's actually a real need in the space for it you don't want to and this happens probably more often than not actually in research and innovation is that people build tools that are solutions that are looking for problems um, just because they had the data or the tool was a lower barrier to build and so you want to be very, very careful to truly hone in before you even think of a model or a innovation or device, whatever, on a true medical need, healthcare need. And then you want to validate that. That might that means talking to your, your end user. That could be patients, that could be radiologists, that could be technologists, could be nurses, um, to actually make sure that, that that need is real. And so once you do that, um, you'll be able to communicate this to collaborators. It could be an entrepreneur, could be an investor. Um, and really state the case for why you need to do this. And you want them to buy into you as, as someone who can build this or be a partner for your institution. Um, the second thing I would say is really make sure if you're looking to commercialize these tools, which is the goal of in a lot of cases, but not necessarily something could be open source. But if you're looking to commercialize early on, you should really look at the market and do an analysis to see what is the size of this market? Is it growing? Is it decreasing? There's a couple different resources online that can help you with this. Um, of course, there's analysts at banks and stuff that, that put out these reports. Um, but you want to make sure there's a real market for it, because at some point you're going to ask a collaborator to kind of buy in, spend their sweat equity working with you. Maybe you're asking for investment. There's going to have to be a projected return on that. So you want to make sure there's a real market for you to actually make this tool. Um, once you have those two down, I would really focus on, you know, after you spend 95% of, of the time looking at the need, you know, you build your model, you build your model, but you build your model or device or digital tool with stakeholders along the whole way, right? So you should build early prototypes, talk to focus groups, talk to the end user, whoever that might be, get feedback and iterate. Um, what you don't want to do is, is kind of sit between, you know, in your lab just by yourself or with your lab mates building something without having stakeholders be involved in providing feedback along the entire way and figuring out in 12 months in a year while you've built something that's really great, but it'll never succeed because it doesn't uh, satisfy this need. And had you talked to a focus group or stakeholder before, they could have told you that early on. So you could have made it a little change. So I would say those are just some, some ways to develop your model or your innovation from the ground up planning a few steps down the road for a future success. I think that's amazing insight. And I think that's that's actually helpful too when you are at RSNA and you're talking to these organizations, actually knowing what you need, you know, like you said, like knowing what your end user needs, it really does help to come into these conversations informed, um, you know, especially because some of these tools can be very expensive, um, resource intensive. So really nailing down what you need from these companies so you can really um, be able to compare. Um, if you can't go the route of creating your own um, innovation or algorithms. Yeah. Um, the next question just is about how can we make AI and, and let's ex let's expand that, like just in terms of technology, these innovations, um, how can you make sure that they benefit everyone? And, and this kind of extends from the question about getting these tools to the uh, community. And I guess kind of a building on that, you know, like are there ways that we can mitigate potential biases um, with AI algorithms? Yeah, I, it's such a challenging problem. Um, we have, we have research at our institution that tells us, um, when you engage un traditionally underrepresented groups to become innovators, they innovate for their population from which they're from, like the demographic, social demographic, underrepresented. Um, so a large part of it is training new folks who might be watching this um, to develop these innovations for their lived experience. And I think that's a huge part of it is that's a leadership component of um, making sure that the innovations that AI you develop is for everyone. And that's kind of from a corporate strategic standpoint. From much of a practical standpoint, um, you know, I would also point to, to reading folks like Efren Flores' research on this as well. Um, he's done a lot of, of this as well, as have you, Randy and um, Anand uh, and Ryan. Uh, so I would say 
having an inclusive eye towards development. Um, this we talked about this a little bit, but having stakeholders from again underrepresented populations, um, diverse socio demographic populations involved every step of the way, and that could mean going into the community, um, going outside of the hospital, outside of the lab. Um, one thing we did um, actually with with Efren uh, a couple of years ago was. We went into the community in Jamaica Plain and and uh, and went to a couple art events and tried to understand from people on the ground what their issues were with access uh, to healthcare for a particular solution um, at the time. Um, and so we, we just like showed up in person and talked to these people one on one. And I think for us that was really that was really illuminating. Um, I would say um, making sure that solutions are accessible and affordable. Um, now, you know, that, that sometimes is at odds with how the system is set up in North America with, you know, having patents and the large R and D costs to, to create some of these cutting edge medication, uh, medications or therapeutics mm -hmm. is that the companies that develop them rightfully, you know, own them and need to make their money back. And then some, um, that's their ethical obligation to the shareholders. And so I think the affordability component is, is at odds. And a lot of times um generics can help with this after a certain amount of time from that intellectual property expiring government can help with this i'll, I'll highlight something called arpa h which i hope many of you have heard of that's a new government program that's pouring a lot of money into developing accessible affordable solutions in specific areas across um the the entire country um and so apply for an arpa h grant if you haven't already and you have a really good idea um I would also say um, one thing is the ability of AI models, speaking of AI specifically, to detect, and this could be through human oversight, when there's a bias or when there's something that's being, uh, there's a outcome that's not being treated equally amongst different groups and to detect that and to have a real world person review it or have the AI be able to adjust um, the algorithm to make it more equitable, um, I think is is one way. And that's kind of like the whole continuous monitoring slash um, evaluation component of AI. So, uh, you know, I would say a few different ways to, to make sure innovations are inclusive, um, you know, and justice for it. Definitely. And I, and I just want to highlight one of the things you said, just in terms of getting into the community, getting into different diverse communities and really building um, that trust and being able to, um, just kind of learn from those like lived experience just so that we can, uh, you know, make sure that we can create these models so that they are applicable um, and um, beneficial um, for all different um, types of groups. So um, just wanted to highlight that point. Um, yeah, can we talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about ethics. I know that um, comes in, comes to comes into play quite a bit when we're talking about, comes into play when we're talking about AI. Um, are there some um, ethical dilemmas um, associated with AI use in healthcare that you've observed personally or that um, really come come to your mind? Yeah, I think one one big one, um, we were doing a couple panels last year, is that folks are concerned about um, access to professionals and to experts. Um, you can imagine a future where certain populations get access to AI physicians or AI radiologists or something, the AI read, whereas others get access to, you know, a 30 year subspecialist, super certified radiologist. So um, there's concern that there's going to be differential access to who gets to see a physician and who gets to see in an AI or a trained physician. And so I think that's a, that's a big ethical dilemma. And so making sure that we're not actually on our way to creating a two tier, three tier healthcare system is something we need to be aware of. Um, and so I think that that's one thing. Um, obviously the bias uh, has to be um, assessed constantly. The data has to be assessed. Um, the performance across different groups has to be assessed in your AI tools on a constant basis to make sure it's not um, veering one way or, or the other. Um, and I would say there should be clarity in the decisions that an AI algorithm comes to. 
um, in order to enable equitable treatment. And so, right, you got to understand why something an AI said something the way it did, and you got to be able to understand that. And if if necessary, intervene and change that recommendation. You know, using your professional judgment. Um, and that that goes back to biases, data sets, unequal uh, groups as well. And so, um, you know, I think those are some ethical dilemmas we're going to be grappling with uh, for a while, specifically that first one on on some people having access to some tools. And this goes for anything in innovation, right? Um, you know, the question is, 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 is having AI become a component of the healthcare, the provisioning of healthcare, is it actually going to increase value and decrease costs? Are there going to be other incentives or stakeholders at play that are going to kind of, you know, take away some of that cost reduction and, and use it in a different way for themselves? And so I think, you know, these are things that, you know, medical societies can certainly help with, like the ACR can help with, you know, providing guidelines and um, white papers on and the Data Science Institute as well. And so I'm hopeful that the expertise in these organizations is going to help us along as well. Um, we'll jump to uh, this question about transparency and understandability. Um, can we make the AI decision-making process more transparent and understandable? Um, and is it possible to achieve effective AI without sacrificing um, explainability? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, let's see why not. Sinho Do has done a lot of uh, interesting research on this and published it um, on explainable AI. and. Um, being involved in that from a peripheral reader standpoint, um, I think it's definitely possible to achieve effective AI um, that's explainable as well. Um, so I think the answer to this question is, is definitely yes. And it's not only yes, but it's something we have to do um, to engender large scale adoption is AI has to make decisions that could be explained and understood um, by the folks that are receiving those decisions. Um, so absolutely, uh, yes, this question. And then um, I've been aware of some of the tools that we that you've actually been, created in, in clinic that we've used to really um, help with um, seeing patients and treating patients, um, mostly related to just kind of the, the language um, and translating. I know we haven't touched on it yet. If that's something you can talk about, I would love for you to share that with the uh, group, some of the innovations that you've actually worked on yeah. uh, that have helped uh, kind of set the stage to be more efficient in, in clinic? Yeah, I think one of them um, that was really cool because uh, it involved a lot of different stakeholders was in JSTAR, it's called Rad Translate around COVID times. And the genesis for that was actually from our diversity, equity, and inclusion group um, at MGH Radiology at the time. That basically, if you remember during COVID, um, we had set up respiratory infection clinics were basically in the communities where all they did was you would come in, get a COVID test, get an x-ray, and then we would just churn through these x-rays, these chest x-rays and read them for COVID. This was like, you know, after, when COVID was at its peak. And so we, it would kind of be like an assembly line of diagnosing COVID patients. And being in the community, there was one community in Chelsea um, around Boston uh, where uh, most of the patients didn't speak English. And so you can imagine um, if you have a patient that doesn't speak English, but you're a technologist and you have to say things like, you know, raise your hands, raise your arms, hold your breath, breathe in, breathe out. Um, it's simple communication, but it's it's still really difficult to do, even though it's one way, um, if you don't speak the language. And you, you had technologists that were kind of like miming what to do, you know, saying it in broken Spanish in this case. Um, so what we did um, after this need was kind of keenly identified by the DI group um, was talk to technologists as the end users. And what did they actually need? What did they actually say in, in the uh, x-ray room for chest x-rays and specifically? Um, what were their scripts? So we got exactly what they said or their prompts um, for patients. Um, we used certified medical interpreters to actually translate these to the top five languages at our system, which was um, like Spanish, Haitian Creole, Mandarin, um, a few other languages, and Portuguese and Italian, I think. Um, and so we translated them and put them in an app online called Rad Translate that can be used on your phone. Um, it was set up on an iPad in the, in the actual x-ray room. And so it had these prompts. It had prompts in English. 
and you would press a button and all of a sudden a kind of like a neural uh, text to speech um, program would then translate that prompt to whatever language you set it as. So it could be Spanish, et cetera. And it would tell the patient exactly what to do. And so it would be a way to communicate one way communication and save the interpreters for the more complex cases. Um, for example, cancer cases, ED cases, where the acuity is much higher. Um, and doing that, we were able to, to decrease the variability in empty room time, um, speed up exams and uh, get better quality images. So that's just one example of a way that, you know, multiple different groups, we had radiologists, we had um, innovators, we had students, we had technologists, we had tech managers, um, PCPs at the clinic that all kind of bought in and created this together. And so it's one example of how like true collaboration at the ground level with diverse stakeholders can create equitable solutions uh, to your problems. Yeah. No, definitely a way to just make the, you know, especially in breast image, make the clinic more efficient, but also improve patient experience. Um, it could be very frustrating. I, I would assume for a patient who, you know, is having to try to understand miming or, you know, so yeah. awesome. Um, so we're coming to the end. I just want to make sure we um, provide you any time. If there's anything you want to share, um, I would love for you to just kind of give a brief overview of the mesh incubator. Sure. I think it's a great program. And then, um, We'll see if there's any last minute questions and we can end there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks again for having me. I would say um, I'm going to throw a link in the chat. I don't know if this will actually work, but maybe Abby can, um, can send it. Is that, um, <clears throat> you know, I think if you're interested, if you're a med student watching this or a trainee, um, I wouldn't be intimidated by, uh, you know, if you want to become an innovator, inventor, whatever it might be. Um, that a large part of it is just being self-directed and um, being willing to to learn and put yourself in uncomfortable positions. Mm -hmm. One one thing we do, and we did at Arsene in 2021 and 2022, is we run an innovation course at Mass General Brigham. Um, it's a week long. At conferences, it's generally a day long, um, where we teach the fundamentals of innovation, things like prototyping, patents, a little bit of AI, digital health, mm -hmm. drug. Um, starting a company, getting venture funding. And so teaching these fundamentals uh, to you um, and uh, helping you speak the language. So when you do go to RSNA or, or ECR or these conferences and you talk with vendors or partners or collaborators, you can, you know what, you know, a market size is or like, a, you know, the ins and outs, maybe a little bit of a patent and disclosure. And so um, to that end, uh, you know, I would invite anyone who's around to attend our course in May um, in Somerville. Uh, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston, we're, we're running the innovation course for people outside of the institute, outside of Mass General Brigham, um, really hoping a lot of students and med students, uh, residents and early career faculty can come. Uh, it's May 20 and 21st. There's a link in the chat um, that hopefully will come through. Um, you know, and then um, the mesh incubator itself, Randy, just as you said, we have that educational component, which is which is what I just talked about. Um, we also have uh, a research component. If you're interested in research and, uh, or sorry, innovation and business in medicine, um, we have a we have a whole lab that is primarily virtual with a lot of students that writes thought leading pieces on innovation. And um, if you're looking just to get involved, and obviously, a large part of your career success is, is output and publishing research and patents and stuff. Um, certainly, um, get in contact. We can help you join that group and I'm hopefully uh, jump on some publications and just whatever your idea might be, help make it a reality. And so that's that's not limited to anyone at our institution. Um, so that, that's an open invitation to folks that are looking for kind of a way in or a little bit of mentorship um, that might not be at, at their institution currently. So, um, and then I would just like to say thanks to Randy um, and also the ACR for highlighting stuff like this. Um, I think there's writing interesting articles throughout the years, you know, being open to publishing stuff on innovation and design thinking, et cetera, et cetera, I think has been really a huge amplification of, of some of the work we've done. And um, as a specialty, we're really lucky to have such an engaged uh, society. Um, so I also wanted to, to send props your way, Randy, and to the whole ACR. Oh, thanks so much, Mark. And, and I just may, I want to make sure, like, you just click on the link. I definitely went through the Mesh Incubator course, and a lot of the things that I learned at that course, I actually utilize in conversations today um, as the chief of the um, division. 
here. So I think it's worth at least um, exploring and checking out. So thanks so much, Mark. This has been a very um, fascinating uh, discussion about AI and new innovation. Uh, definitely um, look out for more articles on AI and innovation in JACR and look out for our next um, case uh, webinar summer, summer session. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Thanks.